Welcome everyone to the Kendall Report, where I share my 43 years of experience to help you manage your portfolios and protect your wealth. I'm here to cut through all the financial noise, giving you the clarity that you're going to need to be profitable in the market. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe. So let's get into tonight's video. Welcome everyone to the Kendall Report. In tonight's video, I want to discuss a couple key elements that have been running around the markets for a while. We've been talking a lot about the debt ceiling. We know what the impact that's had. We've seen a lot of volatility. Markets traded in a range back down around 4150 again, back towards 4250. And we just continue to be in these range bound configurations. McCarthy actually failed in this whole debt ceiling negotiation. It's pretty obvious. All you have to do is look at how many Republicans voted versus how many Democrats. There were more Democrats that voted that for the bill than there was Republicans. And this is a substantial issue. There was also rumors that some earmark deals going on that also kind of tainted this deal. And that would be probably why the Democrats voted more for it than the Republicans. So the whole concept that we can't spend more money going forward than we did the previous year was a joke. And I've been telling you that for a while on the channel. The Senate is expected to pass this possibly on Friday. And what we could see from there, maybe a further market, but I think the market's already priced it in today as we trade it up into almost 4240 again. So like I said, uh, we're seeing this continuation 4150, 4250, that trading range just continues to go on. And every time if you buy that lower end, you had the opportunity on Thursday to buy that 4170. And in fact, if you're watching the market grid, it was spot on on, we printed R3 and almost tried to get to RTX. So it was a very strong day. Everybody on the buy, buy side with the algos betting things up. So that's behind us, I believe. And now the next event that everybody's talking about is the, the Fed and whether they're going to raise rates in this next meeting on the 13th and the 14th of June. And my feeling is, is that they will. But I think so many folks are just focused in on all of the micro situations, looking at all these reports that come out. You know, manufacturing comes in weak and that people are expecting some kind of response to that. And the only thing that the market's watching right now is the employment situation. So we saw the jolts numbers up. We saw ADP come in better. We saw the claims better. Everything's better. The labor market's not going away. And as long as that's the case, you're going to continue to have this underlying bid in the markets. And I've been talking about this for a while, that really what we have going on here is this underlying bid it has a lot to do with how many symbols are in trend mode. That's why I go through the database on a regular basis because that's the number of stocks that are in intermediate trends. And I've talked about this. There's at least another 100 to 120 trading days, which is the better part of six months looking forward that we're likely to have a positive rotation going on in this market. So it's not going away at all. So and let's go to the Fed for a minute, because one of the things that I believe everybody's got it wrong, they're trying to fine tune what element is it that's going to cause the Fed to pause or cause them to pivot. That's the entire narrative that's out there. And I think that's the complete wrong narrative to be looking at, because I've told you before that really what I'm expecting is a sea change. And from a Federal Reserve viewpoint, a sea change refers to a fundamental change in economic activity or some economic event that will affect monetary policy. And as you look at this, that's easy to figure out, right? That was inflation. Inflation numbers are absolutely driven. All of the rate hikes that we've seen over the last year and everybody's talking about how fast it went up. It went up faster than it's ever went up before. And therefore, that means it's going to be a recession coming. 
and the inverted yield curve says there's a recession coming. And I've been on the other side of this trade arguing there's no recession coming. And the point of everything that I see here is that the Fed is wanting out of the whole QE, QT business. They want to downsize the balance sheet the best they can and ultimately get it to a point where it's sustainable and has enough capital there to sustain the economy. You have to realize we're not going back to $900 billion on, on the balance sheet. It's going to be somewhere between five and eight. And it, that's what it takes to support the economy that has grown substantially since the GFC, the great financial crisis. Everything has changed. So it takes a lot more money for to be there as a support. You have to also recall that the Fed decided that they were going to be truly the lender of last resort and a provider of liquidity. And that was in 2020 when the banks no longer had to really hold any money on the balance sheets. People talk about fractional banking. It's really kind of went away. The Fed said, hey, you don't even need to have any reserves. We'll take care of everything. And that's why when the Republic Bank and SBB, when all that was going on with the regional banks, this is why I talked about this was a very limited crisis, as it was called. It really was not significant in any kind of material way like it was in 2008 when banks were collapsing. The reality is in 2008, the, the contrast is that in 2008, there was toxic waste on the balance sheets. This time it was at least treasuries. So you're going to get paid. Doesn't mean there wasn't depreciation and other issues. So there are definitely issues there, but the Fed made it clear when they opened up the discount window and made it available to everyone. So if they had any issues, they just go to the discount window. This is the same scenario, same strategy that if you go back to Volcker for the most part, little different scenario, but they, they made liquidity available if you needed it. And there was even a penalty back in 80, uh, between 80 in 83 is if you hit the discount window too often, you would get a, a surcharge on top of that. I believe the surcharge was as much as 4%. So let's go back to the C change. I really believe that what we're going to see going forward is a whole different Federal Reserve. The markets are going to run different. And Paul said it several meetings ago. It was an answer to a question. I, I've been joking that I was the only one that actually heard it. But I, I bought into it. I realized he just told us exactly what they are doing. And they're going to keep these rates higher for longer. They're getting out of the Q, QE, QT. Once QT is done, they're not going to add any more back in. They're not going to come and do helicopter ban. None of this stuff is going to happen. They're going to recapitalize the markets. And they're still going to be there as the backstop and overall, what we're going to see is a confidence come back into the marketplace. I've also been quoted as saying that one of the best places you're probably going to make money going forward is going to be in some of these beat down banks, the good banks, not the bad ones. So there are bad banks out there that, that aren't investable, but there's a lot of really good banks that have good balance sheets and are going to make. So I'm just going to continue down this rant and go through even the whole credit contraction scenario that's out there. There will definitely be some of that going on, but it's not going to be catastrophic. You have to realize that it's like living in zero hedge. Everything is a catastrophe. Everything's going to roll over and we're going to go back into this massive crisis. Very easy to look at uh, what's going on here and come up with my hypothesis of the Fed just going back to the Fed of old. And I'm going back to the Fed of in the 1960s and 1970s. And I realize that I've always criticized those that look in the rearview mirror, but that is, from a functionality standpoint, is going to be much more stable than what has been created going back to the days of Paulson and Bernanke and all the bailouts that went on in the banking system. I would argue that it was probably the right thing to do in 2008. Uh, you can also go back. I went through the SNL crisis. It's 
what we're going through right now with the regional banks and the community banks are similar to that, but not even close to being on the scale. I continue to expect everything to kind of round out in the end and off we go and the economy starts to uh, continues to go forward. I'm not a, a disaster scenario kind of person. It's really easy to put that out there. The analogy I would make is sort of like predicting when someone's going to die. The will of the human being that wants to stay alive will live much longer than you think. And the will of the people that want to live and make and continue to prosper in this country and everywhere in the world is also very powerful. So if you think things are bad, there's somebody out there trying to fix it, profit from it, doing something. That's the beauty of the capitalist system. Let's go back to the Fed. The Fed most likely will raise rates by 25 bips, and the, that will put us at close to my terminal rate, five and a quarter, five and a half. I think they're done there. I don't think they pivot. I hate when I hear what the market is pricing in stuff. The Fed fund futures are the worst predictor of anything. When it's obvious they figure it out, but they're not very good. I mean, two days ago, they were 70% that the Fed was going to raise, and now they're at 30. So they're, they're just traders, and everybody's trying to, to make a bet on everything. Point is, is that I believe we'll get a rate increase, and I think the Fed will pause after that but they're not going to pivot down. I still don't see the economy slowing down. Maybe we'll see some metrics start to break down. At the moment, there's no reason to be concerned about it. Depending on what these unemployment numbers come out with tomorrow is going to be pretty interesting as well. Just in conclusion, to wrap up, as we come into the end of the week, uh, like I said, I don't have stats on the database or anything like that to talk to you about tonight because it comes out later in the day. But I did want to put an end of the week video. I'm working on some formats to get some other things out to you folks. And I'll, I'll continue just to evolve in this new environment. What we'll do from here, I will go through and just show the setup for the end of the week, S&P and NASDAQ. I know a lot of you are going to want me to cover all the markets I normally cover. Not going to happen tonight. Possibly over the weekend, I'll come up with a different video. So let's get into that. We'll cover the hourly chart just to set you up for Friday. Hourly chart, some interesting things I'm going to show you. I'm going to give you a sneak peek of some of the new indicators that are coming out. But first, let's just look at it from a pure analysis viewpoint. It looks like we are going to get a peak in momentum around tonight, around 10 o'clock tonight, Eastern time. So we should start to see it flatten. The markets flatten out a little bit. There's a little bit of a downtick at the moment, but nothing huge. But it, all of the angle of attack you can see is very positive here. But you do see PPM1 starting to roll over and those type of things. So I'm going to show you, uh, we're going to go to the same hourly chart. And I'm just going to tease you a little bit because I'm very close. I'm hoping that next week we're going to have all this out. Uh, a couple of things that are here is we have the the same predictive SMAs that are going to be available, but there's also probabilities attached to them. So it's looking at the angle of attack and attaching probabilities to certain events happening. And I'll have a video that explains that. The dotted lines that you see here is the daily market grid plotted on the hourly chart. And that is going to be very powerful. I can actually even go to a one minute chart and show you that uh, or five minute chart so it also will show those numbers so if you're trading intraday the other thing that you're seeing here with the numbers and the triangles this is the stx signal counter so it gives you when there's it will count how many stx consecutive signals you have and on this one i notice typically somewhere around two to possibly three are right where the bottom forms. You can see earlier this morning, we actually came in and had a buy signal the at the low, which was an STX buy signal, and the market 
completely reversed from there. The Augos were also predicting that the markets were going to improve from that. And of course, we got that vertical move off of the lows this morning. Going to the daily chart, you'll see I still have the same predictive uh, strategies on here, but you will see that the angle of attack is still up. I talked about this on the video I did on Monday, as this is continuing to be this positive slope. It's not this super strong slope, but it looks like that's going to continue. The pattern, though, we, do, we are seeing that the market grid is turning up, and I will give you the grid numbers are over here on the uh, far right-hand side, and those numbers are right here. We're looking at R2 is 42.52, S1 was 42.16. Those of you that went on to my Twitter spaces I did last night, I had numbers 40, 4177 was the target was S1, R2 for today, R2 was 4217, R3 was 4231. We almost got to RTX today, but S1 for yesterday was 4177, the low was 4178, so it was right on the money. All right, we'll review the NASDAQ. I have the same predictive numbers on here. We've got this very steep slope that I've been talking about for a number of days. This is the daily. We just continue to climb along that line. We did get down to 14051 was the 10 period moving average. We, we came just short of that. We came down to 14248 and we bounced off of there and we continue to see this go forward. Now, I do have the uh, the NASDAQ market grid plotted on here as well. So if I go over to the hourly chart, you'll be able to see those numbers. So any market, when you get your hands on these new indicators, you'll be able to take the daily market grid for whatever stock you're trading, Tesla, whatever, you'll be able to apply all these numbers. But back to the daily, just looking at a very sharp upward slope here and the NASDAQ continues to lead the way. Thank you so much, folks, for watching the video. I do want to remind you that you should really take a look at our indicators. They're at www.kendallreport.com slash indicators. You will be able to find out exactly how to get access to them. We have a new suite coming out, and if you buy this suite, you will get a deep discount on the new release, and we're continuing to expand our tools that you're able to use. So if you like what you've seen in this video today, go check that out. I look forward to having more content out to you very soon. Thanks for watching.